Well, hello, happy Friday. My name is William Hemsworth, and thank you for joining me on KKMC. Today's show, I think, is going to be very interesting. Like I said, the show is called Deep in Church History. So let's kind of start from the beginning. Let's start. We're not going to start within the scriptures, at least right now, but what we're going to do is talk about the history of Bible translation, particularly early on from 100 to 500 A.D. because it lays the groundwork of the translation work that is going on today. It's kind of laid the groundwork of Christianity spreading across the known world as well. But but then again, again, welcome to KKMC. It's 1.30 on a Friday afternoon. I hope everyone has had a great week. I hope everyone has an even better weekend. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Now, throughout the history of the Christian church, Bible translation has played a critical role in transmitting the gospel message. Now, whether it was Jews in the intertestamental period or all the way up to today, the scriptures have been an invaluable tool with eternal significance. Jesus gives a command to his apostles at the end of Matthew, Mark, And at the beginning of Acts, this command became known as the Great Commission, and it's Christ's command to go to all nations to teach the gospel. Throughout the history of the early church, the scriptures played a pivotal role in missionary activity and evangelization. Now, when it comes to Bible translation from A.D. 100 to 500, it's wise to look at the effects that the Septuagint had on this process. And then we'll kind of look into other earlier versions such as the Syriac, Coptic, and Latin and their effects on missions and why they're still significant today. Whatever the precise number of languages there may be, it's certainly surprising that by AD 600, the four Gospels had been translated into only a few languages. These were Latin and Gothic in the West, Syriac, Coptic, Armenian, Georgian, Ethiopic, and Sogian in the East. Now, we're talking about Bible translation from AD 100 to 500, so you may be wondering, like, why are we even going to talk about the Septuagint since this happened before Christ came to earth? You see, it's important because it serves as a prelude to what comes later in history. The Septuagint laid the groundwork for Bible translation, especially Bible translation to the vernacular. The most important and and influential translation of Scripture ever made was the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament into Greek. The Septuagint came, came about because the Jewish people were dispersed, and as a result some were Hellenized and no longer spoke or read Hebrew. Koine Greek was the language of the day, so legend has it that 72 Jewish scholars met at the court called Ptolemy for a period of 72 days. It not only allowed Jews outside of Palestine to read the Jewish scriptures in a language in which they were familiar, but had an incredible influence on the writers of the New Testament. This influence is one that we look at, it can't be understated, and I think we have a tendency today to do that. Now, whether one considers its fidelity to the original, its influence over the Jews, and its place in the Christian church, the Septuagint stands in a preeminent, it stands preeminent in the light it casts on the study of Scripture. Now, the New Testament was remarkable in that it was written in Koine Greek, which, like I said a moment ago, was the dialect understood by commoners in the Roman Empire. Now this, along with with evangelizing, led to Christianity spreading like wildfire. It spread far and wide. It would reach so far that by the end of the second century, there was a need for a translation in Syriac. This occurred when Christianity began to spread east from Antioch. Though most of the population in Antioch spoke Greek, there were other parts of Syria where they did not. Now this was problematic from an evangelism standpoint. Though the church was perfectly able to speak, speak orally, be, you know, having one local language allowed for easier transmission and copying. 
Now, in regards to the ancient Syriac language, historian William Harris states, quote, It is an offshoot of Aramaic and emerged around Edessa in the first century. This is significant as Edessa is also known as the only center of Christian life where the language of the community was other than Greek. Syriac became the preferred language for Christians in eastern Syria, Persia, Mesopotamia, and later India, China, and Mongolia. This is an incredible range which covers great mileage in the Middle East and Asia. Remember, this is only in the early 2nd century. It's truly amazing. This is no coincidence as the two mission-driven churches thrived in the area. This was the language of the Jacobite and Nestorian churches, the most active missional movements in the East throughout the early church period. Now, the Syriac version also became an innovator with how the Gospels were presented. Like our translations today, the Greek had the four Gospels as separate books. In the, in the second century, the Syrian theologian Tatian combined the Gospels into one harmonious volume. This became known as the Diatessaron, which is a musical term for harmony. It was an influential work, as we see from the early church historian Eusebius, which writes, quote, Their former leader, however, Tatian, arranged a kind of joining together and compilation of the Gospels. I know not how, to which he gave the title the Diatessaron, and it is still to this day to be found in the hands of some. Now, whether it was written in Greek and translated or written in Syriac from the start is a matter of debate. But what we do know is that the Syriac Christians, Christians were reading the scriptures in their own language, and that led to a boom in Christianity in the region. Tatian and his harmony of the gospel had its naysayers, but the results were great, and the Diatessaron was read widely until it was abolished in 423 AD. The Syriac translation also has a legacy of being the earliest translation of the New Testament. Its influence would be felt for centuries to come, as other versions were highly influenced by that particular translation. Now, if the Septuagint was the most influential translation of Scripture ever produced, now I'll argue that the Latin translation was a very close second. You see, in the early, in the early church period, there were many Latin translations around, but the most popular became known as the Vulgate, which means the language of the people. Its influence was so immense that it was named the official translation of the Catholic Church at the Council of Trent. Now, in regards to the Vulgate, Pope Sixtus V wrote in his papal bull, Eternus Isle, that the Vulgate was to be received as, quote, true, lawful, authentic, and unquestioned, quote. So what are the other Latin translations? So contrary to what some may think, the Latin translation did not originate with the early church father, St. Jerome. Now, St. Jerome... What St. Jerome did is he kind of, he, he perfected it, basically, because there were a lot of other translations floating around that were not very accurate. And so Latin, it was actually a very early translation in church history and probably started around the 2nd and early 3rd century. And I'm talking in regard to other Latin translations. The versions prior to the Vulgate are known as the Old Latin and helped spread Christianity in parts of the world where Greek was no longer the prominent language. Now, though Latin was a, ma a major language in the Roman Empire, the Latin versions did not originate in Rome. The language used by the Church of Rome was Greek until the mid-3rd century. The old Latin versions would have not originated there, but in those early Christian communities that used Latin. Now, this most likely occurred in North Africa as Greek wasn't widely used there, especially at that time. The Old Latin, this is the version prior to Jerome's Vulgate, was plagued with textual issues. The differences were immense, and these manuscripts varied not only in literary style, but in the quality of translation. 
they were not translated by one individual or by a, they, or, or even by a committee. History has shown that church fathers in North Africa, such as Tertullian and Cyprian, used different language on the same passages. And these are from Old Latin texts. Now, in regards to this issue, uh, historian Bruce Metger writes, quote, Since one finds numerous and far-reaching differences between quotations of the same passages, it's obvious that there was no uniform reading. Some books were apparently translated a number of times, and no single translator worked on all the books, end quote. Now, though there were issues in the trend. Though there were issues, the translation came about because of a need for the scriptures in the vernacular. As I said a moment ago, Greek fell by the wayside and was not widely used in northern Africa. But Latin was the language of the masses. Someone took it upon themselves to start translating. And this may have happened during times of worship. In worship assemblies in the late 2nd century, In the late 2nd century African church, the Greek scriptures were read with a simultaneous line-by-line translation into Latin, probably followed by facilitating understanding in the vernacular. We may call that a homily or a brief sermon of sorts. The variant readings were becoming an issue, and the church fathers such as Augustine were getting concerned. This concern was shared by Pope Damasus, and Damasus had a scholar for a secretary named Sophronius Eusebius Hieronymus, but we know him as St. Jerome. Pope Damasus, Pope Damasus gave Jerome the duty of revising the Old Latin text. Now, Jerome was hesitant to engage in the endeavor, but did so out of obedience to the Pope. Jerome wrote to wrote Pope Damasus, You urge me to revise the Old Latin version, and as it were, to sit in judgment on the copies of the scriptures, which are now scattered throughout the whole world. And inasmuch as they differ from one another, you would have me decide which of them agree with the Greek original. The labor is one of love, but at the same time both perilous and presumptuous. You see, Jerome knew that the work he would do would draw vehement criticism from some people. Now, Jerome completed his work on the Gospels in 385, and the rest of the Bible was completed in the early 5th century. One interesting thing Jerome did was in regard to the Old Testament. Instead of translating from the Septuagint, he translated from the Hebrew. Now, this carried with it a couple issues. One issue, especially one that St. Augustine um, brought up, considered the Septuagint inspired and thought the Latin should have been translated from it. Now, second, the Hebrew editions of the Old Testament did not have the books that would that some called the Apocrypha and some called the Deuterocanon. So it would be like Maccabees, Tobit, etc. Though Jerome did not initially see these books as inspired or canonical, Uh, They were included at the request of the Pope, and he later assented to agreeing to their canonicity. Now, nevertheless, the Vulgate would would change the face of Christendom and serve to help evangelize multitudes of people. Now, though the Latin translation may have originated in northern Africa, Latin itself was used through a majority of the Roman Empire. This helped the Vulgate gain acceptance as the people were able to understand it, even if they were not able to read. The Vulgate helped to establish Latin as the primary language of worship in the West. This version of scripture stood the test of time and was in use for over 1,000 years. It deeply affected the theology of the Catholic Church, and both Protestants and Catholics shared the words that were made popular by St. Jerome. These, these words include regeneration, salvation, sanctification, propitiation, reconciliation, and inspiration. You see, if you're a Christian, you're indebted to this translation and for the many souls it helped save. 
Now, the next language, one of the, one of the other language of scriptures were translated into very early on was Coptic. And Coptic was the morphing of the ancient Egyptian language. Egyptian Christians wrote the native language using 24 Greek letters, with the addition of seven signs taken over from a more cursive variety of Egyptian very, uh, letters to express sounds that did not exist in spoken Greek. Coptic is almost entirely religious in nature, and many Greek words that were used to explain doctrine derived from it. This can be seen with the church father Athanasius, and he's con- he contributed to it. It helped contribute to our understanding of the of the to his understanding of the Trinity when he squared off against Arius at the Council of Nicaea. Coptic was developed in an attempt to differentiate Christianity from the pagan views of ancient Egypt. Now it's not really known who developed it, but it may have been an oral tradition that was later written down. You see, there are six dialects of Coptic: the Sahidic, Baharic, Ekamimic, Subakamimic, Middle Egyptian and Fayumic. Translation started in Coptic because of a need, once again, to have a vernacular translation. The need of scripture in Coptic was derived from a mission's focus. It was needed to, ev- it was needed to evangelize and disciple. In other words, the Great Commission was being obeyed. But Coptic was needed to disciple new converts in the Christian faith. Like other translations, it underwent revision as the church in Egypt grew. Coptic was so entrenched in church life that it remained the language of the church even after Arabic became the official language. The Coptic scriptures were important to the spread of the church in Egypt. It came about because of a need to teach the people the faith and was in use for several hundred years. Translation of the Bible to the vernacular has been a critical component in missions. We're, we're indebted it, and we're indebted to it today. I mean, there are hundreds of translations of the Bible available today in many different languages. And this is where it all started. This is where we get deep into church history to become grateful for what we have today and see the origins of it. History has shown that when the scriptures are presented and the people have access, that there will be conversions and disciples being made. And there are many, there are a couple other languages that the scriptures were translated into within this early period, again from 100 to 500 A.D. And we've only covered we've only covered Syria, Syriac, Latin, and Coptic. You see, all three translations have something in common. They were developed with the need to evangelize and disciple. They were not translated so someone could have a copy, but for the people. The translators of these early versions understood the importance of having a translation in their language and made it easier to proclaim and teach the faith. The Bible has been translated into many languages, including Latin, German, English, and other places that Christians went. The importance of Bible translation can be seen from the beginning of the church. The Syriac translation was the first to translate the Greek New Testament to a vernacular language. The Assyrian church used the version in its missionary activities and were able to spread the Christian message as far as China. Human beings have an innate need to verify information that they're given. Having a translation in their tongue allows someone to verify what they're being told. It helps them personalize it and lets them know that the gospel is something that is accessible. The gospel is thus seen to be one yet diverse. It is given yet culturally adapted to its audience. The message of the Bible is one that is universal for all people and is understood in any language. God made us. He loves us in spite of our rebellious attitude toward him, and he wants to reconcile us to himself. This is the role, this is what Bible translation has helped achieve. It has shown a people, in their own language, the message and beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
The translations in the Syriac, Latin, and Coptic changed the world because they helped expand Christianity all over the world. The history of the Bible, the history of Bible translation from AD 100 to 500, it's a very interesting topic. I mean, this show is only a half hour long. I could go on for a couple hours, but I'm going to spare you. To the everyday believer, it may not seem like much. But these translations in these early periods laid the foundations for the translations we enjoy today. Do you like the English Standard Version? Thank these early translators. You like the King James Version? Thank these early translators. You like the New Revised Standard Version? Thank these early translators. You like the New American Bible? Thank these early translators. Without the translations in the Syriac, Latin, or Coptic, we may not be able to read what the scriptures say. Now, through this research, through this research, it's become apparent that we take all the translations of scripture. We take them. We take all these translations of scripture in, in, that we have in English for granted. I mean, we have so many different translations. We, like I said, we just take it for granted. And there's some people, there's some languages where the Bible's not even translated into yet. The Eastern churches utilized the Syriac text to take the gospel from Syria all the way to China. I've mentioned that a couple times before. They encountered great danger, but they wanted to fulfill the Great Commission. The Old Latin text had many textual variants, and some of the variants were great. Yet Greek was no longer the spoken language in Northern Africa, and someone started translating the scripture to Latin. Now, it should be noted with these old Latin texts, even though there may have been variants in them, the church taught the people the correct way, so those variants couldn't do any damage. Scriptures were translated to Coptic for the need of evangelism and discipleship. There are still many languages that don't have the scriptures in their own language. Now, no doubt, translation is a very time-consuming ordeal, but history has shown that having scriptures in one's own language is a key missionary force. Well, guys, the title of the show is Deep in Church History. We've kind of gone deep into translation issues in the first few centuries of the Christian era. I think these are some things that we take for granted. Like, like, I, know, I know I sound like a broken record when I say this, but we go to Barnes & Noble, we go to the Bible section, and we have this plethora of translations there. And we reach for our favorite one, which is nothing, there's nothing wrong with doing that, by the way. I'm not saying not to reach for your favorite one. Please do. The best translation from is one that you'll read, as long as it's faithful to the original text of Greek and Hebrew. But what if you didn't live in the, in the United States and you didn't have all these publishing companies coming up with their own version for copyright reasons? We wouldn't have the NIV. We wouldn't have the Revised Standard Version. We wouldn't have the New Living Translation, etc. We would have maybe one translation. We are very blessed to have so many translations of scriptures in English. Yet as a whole, as a people in America, we are not taking advantage of this. Bible reading, everyday Bible reading, is at an all-time low. Priorities are out of whack. Let's get a priority straight. People died in the early church People died in the early church for their faith. They died in the early church for having a piece of parchment that had maybe one scripture written on it. Let's reset our mind. Let's reset our focus. Let's get back. Let's be thankful for what our forefathers in the faith have done in translating these texts and take advantage Let's grow our faith. Let's help change our lives. Let's read scripture. 
Let's pray. Guys, thank you so much for joining me this week on Deep in Church History. This is a very interesting topic. Like I said, I can go on for a long time about it. But I hope you got something out of it. I thank you very mu- I thank you so much for joining me each Friday afternoon at 1.30 here on KKMC. If you want to make a donation to the show, the show is listener-supported. You can do so by PayPal. And my email address, my PayPal email address is william.hemsworth at gmail.com. Or you can check out my other work. I have a couple other shows as well. The well, podcast, not radio shows. And blogs. I write books as well. You can check out my work on patreon.com backslash William Hemsworth. Thank you so much for joining me. And we'll catch you next week as we start to dig in to the ancient early text, the Didache. God bless you. Thank you again for joining me. God bless you and keep you.